All right, so today we're going to cover all the content you need to know for AP Statistics Unit 3. Okay, so the first thing we're going to talk about are sampling methods. Okay, so the most common one you're going to see is Simple Random Sample, or SRS. Um, it's a random selected subset of the population, and all members in the sample have an equal chance of being selected. And here's the general process you would typically use when doing a simple random sample. You're going to define the population and label the individual. So what that actually looks like in practice is you're assigning numbers to people, or you're putting their names on a slip of paper. And then number two is you have to randomize, okay? That's why it's called a random sample. So you can do, do randomization through a random number generator, put people's names in hats, whatever. And number three is just select members of the sample for your simple random sample. So the next uh, sampling process we're gonna talk about is stratified random sample, where you're gonna split the population into groups or strata based on shared traits, okay? Um, these are basically shared traits as in like homogeneous groups. Okay. You have groups where they share certain traits. So let's say you have PrepWorks subscribers. Okay. I split you guys into PrepWorks subscribers and PrepWorks not subscribers. Okay. And then what you're going to do from there is randomly select samples from each group. So if I had, um, 10 PrepWorks subscribers and 10 PrepWorks not subscribers, I'd randomly select say two people from each group for everyone in that group has equal chance of being selected. Uh, so here's another example. You divide a school by grade level and then randomly pick students from each grade. Now the confusing part with stratified random sample is there's a very, very particular close second to it is a cluster sample, okay? It sounds very similar. You're splitting the population into groups slash clusters and then randomly selecting entire clusters. I made that bold for a reason, okay? I made that capital letters for a reason. Entire clusters to sample. So example of that is splitting a city into neighborhoods and surveying everyone in a few randomly chosen neighborhoods, okay? So here's a diagram to uh, make sure that is depicted nicely. So for a stratified random sample, I split it into red people and blue people, right? And then within the red people, I do a simple random sample. And then within the blue people, I do a simple random sample. Uh, but for cluster sampling, what I do is my groups, instead of having homogeneous traits, right? My stratified random sample is either you're red or you're blue. In cluster sampling, I want equal uh, heterogeneous, you know, like equal representation essentially, right? So basically I have like, you know, some red people, some blue people, yada, yada, yada. And then when I pick uh, who to survey, I'm picking entire clusters. So I pick a random cluster and then I sample everybody in that cluster, okay? The next uh, sampling technique we're going to talk about is systematic random sample. That's where you select individuals at regular or set intervals and you start at a random point. So for example... If I was like sitting outside the outside of my school or something, and every fifth person that walked in, I would give them a survey, right? That's systematic random sample. All right, so we're gonna talk about some bad sampling methods. Convenient sample is where you basically choose people who are like easy to reach, easy to access. Example of that is surveying people at a nearby mall only because it's close to you. And the other bad sampling method, I mean, there's tons, but these are the most common, uh, is voluntary response sampling. So you allow people to choose to participate um, let's say you put like an online poll, right? Uh, let's say you have like a TV show or something and then you're like, hey, you should answer this online poll about, you know, said issue. Well, people who feel strongly about that issue are more likely to respond. You're giving that, you're giving them the choice, right? So that introduces bias and that's why it's a bad sampling method. Here are a couple more shortcomings. Uh, number one is undercover. So when some groups are left out or underrepresented, in the sample. So for example, if you send a survey only to people with internet access, then people who don't have access to the internet can't give their opinion. Um, and therefore that is under coverage. Non-response is when your selected individual don't or can't respond. So for example, if you call somebody and you're like, hey, can you do the survey? Yada, yada, yada. And they say no. Well, that's non-response bias and uh, shortcoming as well. Next up, we have response bias. When people give false or misleading answers, um, so this is like the equivalent of lying. Now, sometimes it can just be about lying, right? But it's not like explicitly them trying to lie, but it's just that their answers are prone to some sort of bias. Um, let's say you had, I don't know, let's say you were reviewing our YouTube channel, right? But let's say you are a friend of me, right? So like, you know me in person. Well, then you're going to be having response bias because you know me in person and yada, yada, yada. Okay. I think you get the point. Next up is wording in the question. So if you poorly phrase the question or you, you know, it's a biased question, it influences the answers. So if I ask you, do you want to subscribe to Preparate's Education? That might be a good question on its own. 
But if I say, do you want to subscribe to Prep Education to receive $1 million? There's a little bribe at the end, right? So the wording in the question there is poorly phrased, it's biased, and it influences your answer. Okay, so now let's talk about observational studies and experiments. So an observational study is different from an experiment because in an observational study, you only observe and collect the data without influencing the subjects, okay? So for example, if you just sit in your car and then you watch other people in their car and you see how many people use seatbelts in their car, you can't do anything about them, right? You're just simply sitting there and observing variables of interest. The observational study is the direct opposite of the experiment. Now, why? Well, because in the experiment, you are manipulating variables or applying treatments to observe and measure the effects on the subjects, right? And when you conduct a experiment, you want to follow four principles. And when you are answering questions, make sure each of these principles are clear in your explanations for full credit. Comparison, you want to compare two or more groups to see the difference in the treatment. Random assignment, you know, just randomly assigning uh, subjects to groups to reduce bias. Uh, you can also be randomly assigning treatments. Control, so you have to keep all variables constant. You've probably heard this before. Replication, uh, make sure you have enough subjects. So don't just do an experiment with two people. Do it with a sufficient number, respectable amount. A couple more key vocab terms is factor. So factor is the explanatory variable or independent variable. It's just a term used when there are multiple independent variables. Level is just a specific value or category of the factor. Um, so it could be like sunlight is a factor, but then it could be like low sunlight is like level or high sunlight. Confounding is when another variable affects the results. So like if you don't properly have a control group and it's hard to determine the true cause of your results or your treatment. Placebo is a fake treatment where participants may react favorably to it. A uh, single blind is when the subjects don't know which group they're in, so the treatment being assigned, um, but the researchers do. Double blind is when neither the subjects or researchers know who gets what treatment or what, or who's assigned to what group. So we're going to finish off with the randomized block design. So a randomized block design is a specific type of experimental design where subjects are divided into blocks or groups based on specific characteristics. So it's kind of like the stratified random sample. Um, and each block is randomly assigned a treatment. And a block is just a group with experimental units with the same characteristic. So here we have a similar study population. So let's say our study population is PrepWorks viewers viewing this video right now. And so we're going to split them into two blocks. Okay, we have block one is PrepWorks subscribers because they all have the same characteristic, right? They're all subscribed to the channel. And then we have another group or another block is not subscribers. They have the same characteristic, they're not subscribed to our channel. And then from here to actually conduct the experiment uh, with the randomized block design to properly do it, we need to assign treatments, right? So I don't know what experiment we're running, but to assign the treatments, we need to randomly like assign the treatments. And we can do that with, I don't know, random number generator, names in a hat, whatever. All right, so the last ex experimental design type we're going to talk about is matched pairs design. Okay, this is a specific type of experimental design where your subjects are paired based on specific characteristics and each pair is randomly assigned a treatment or one subject in each pair could be a control. So example of this is think about, um, let's say you're doing an experiment and then you want to sort of like eliminate bias based on gender. Then you can pair like a male with a female and then you know, have one of them be the control group or just randomly assign the treatments between them. So yeah, that was a lot of vocab and not a lot of, you know, crunching numbers and stats. I know it's weird. There's a lot of interpretation here. Make sure you really know these vocab terms because that serves as the basis of your interpretation and designing your own experiments and, you know, interpreting, oh, is this a bad sampling method and all that. But yeah, that does it for all the content you need to know for AP Statistics Unit 3.